It's exciting to be here and to experience God's Word. We're continuing in our, our series, Forged by Fire. And uh, this week, it was kind of a little bit more challenging uh, because sometimes there are things in the Bible that I encounter that are very difficult. Sometimes there are things that I'm reading, and I just, to be honest, I just don't like them. I don't understand. It's like, God, what's going on? I, I don't get it. But then I remember that I'm operating, operating from a finite, limited perspective, and I'm trusting a God who is wise and all-knowing, and I can trust him. So rather than judging God by the things that I don't understand, I trust him on the vast majority of things that are very understandable and trust that he will po provide guidance on those things that are difficult. Now, the one thing about expository Bible preaching is you can't avoid the next passage. And the passage that we're looking at today is uh, one of those ones that is, can be controversial. That's why it's titled Targeted Teaching. We're dealing with seven verses today as we continue in this whole aspect of a new behavior. And we're looking at con conduct, Christian conduct, and it's in the relationship of the marriage. And so the, today's teaching is really related to Christian husbands and wives and how they interact together. Now, the, the problem is, is the things that are said here are highly controversial in our current culture. Now, the eternal word of God is not controversial, but how we, we live things out can be really challenging. Uh, you know, when I'm talking about the things that I dis discover in the Bible that are very difficult sometimes, I was, I was reading, I've been reading through the Judges, and I tell you, there are some crazy things that take place in the Judges. And I'm like, I just don't understand that. I don't get it. This is difficult. How can there be a solution for this? But as I've read through the Bible multiple times, it's interesting when we loop back around, the things that were confusing for me three, four years ago now began to make sense. As, we read and, as I read and study God's word, these things that are confusing have some clarity. And so hopefully as we look at the passage today in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it will provide greater clarity for a challenging teaching. If you have your Bibles or, or a device, you can follow along or you can follow along on screen as we pick up in our study in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respect, respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adornings be external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Verse 7, Likewise, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we open up this word today, we ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate the unchanging truth of your word and help us to apply it in our lives. Because, Lord, you want us to be different as a result of the word which is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. May it cut into our hearts to show us the areas where we need to grow and change and transform our thinking to align with the truth of your word. And, and that we, so that we can be a positive examples in a culture and in a society that is in increasingly living in chaos. We look to you, Lord, to be our teacher this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the main idea that we're looking at today in this message is who you are in Christ guides how you interact with your spouse. Who you are in Christ is the determining factor for how you're going to interact not only with, with your spouse, but in all relationships because our identity in Christ is the guiding factor for all of these interpersonal relationships, but particularly in marriage relationships. Now, you might be saying, hey, I'm not single. I'm not thinking about getting married. Um, and so it doesn't this message doesn't apply to me. Well, no. Here's the reality. There are communications and interpersonal relationship principles that apply to each and every person. If you 
are thinking about the possibility of getting married, this definitely applies to you because there, there are concepts that will help you as you enter into that covenant relationship of marriage. But we need to remember the larger context of what's taking place here. You know, Peter is writing to the church in Diaspora, preparing them for persecution. There was a lot of, of hostility towards Christians, increasingly so. And so they've had to live lives that were exemplary in a world that did not have an appreciation for the God of the Bible. We talked about some of those things in relationships. We talked about, you know, the, the fact that there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at this time and how people who were living as slaves could have witnesses and testimony that could win others to Christ. We see now with the conversion and the growth of, con conversion, growth of Christians, there were couples, some of whom, where the, the spouse became a believer and they had an unbelieving spouse. And so that created some tension. And how could you work through these difficult circumstances in uh, the, the marriage relationship? So we're going to look at uh, the, the breaking down of this passage is going to be really disproportionate. We're going to break it down into two parts. One, we're going to be looking at the word to the wives. And then the second part, we're going to be looking at the word to husbands. But there's six verses that are attributed to words to the wives and only one verse that's attributed to the words to the husband. So we're going to have to, 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 we're going to be breaking down all of that. So just be aware that there's going to be a disproportionate amount of time spent in the first part. But guys, don't think you're off the hook just because it's one verse. <laughs> that one verse is packed with some very serious things. But really, it's acknowledging the context for women in this context was how they could overcome some of these uh, extra challenges that they were facing to live in a way that honors God. So as we examine the Christian conduct in the family, the Bible speaks a word to the wives. And we see that in verses 1 through 6. First of all, we're going to break this down into three categories to make it more manageable. First, we're going to look at the, uh, the character of a godly wife in verses 1 and 2. Now, this really is an outlining of the strategy that takes place of how you can live in a, in a, in a healthy way in healthy relationships. Verse 1, it says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. So here we, we see a, a very interesting passage. You know, that likewise is, is continuing from the, the submission to authority that we read in chapter 2. And so we were going off of that, that chapter 2 where it's talking about how to live under authority and to live in a way that, that shows respect for authorities. And so they use that word likewise in the same way that you saw the, the response of how to live as a righteous slave when slavery is bad, how you can live in a righteous way to honor Jesus even in the midst of those, those bad conditions. He says likewise in the same type of way, wives, we have a message for you. It says be subject to your own husbands. Now, as we break this down, we're going to see that this is related to direction and information for wives, not for every single woman, because it's not saying that every woman has to be subject to every man. This is in the context of a family relationship here. And it's saying, saying wives, be subject to your own husbands. That's where your own husbands, this is talking about a marriage relationship here. Now, that subject to, that's one of the ones that raises the hackles. Isn't that demeaning to say be subject to? Well, you have to understand that that term subject to has a, some, some uh, it's a hupotasso, and it means to submit. But submit is just another word uh, for a word that we commonly use and have no problem with. And that word is yield. So when we see subject to or submit to, we're just talking about yielding. That's a voluntary uh, letting somebody else's opinion have a sway in your life when you come to a sign in the road and it says yield that means you're supposed to let the other traffic go through now you can run through that yield sign and, and but there it can create a, a, a dangerous situation if there's there's conflict and so this is providing order and structure for healthy interpersonal relationships but what we need to make sure that we don't do is that we take these words and we try to impute meaning into them to make it a basis for beating down people or making people feel inferior or less than that, does, that is not what the context is saying here. What we he see here is advice to wives to see, be submissive to their husband so that even if some don't obey the word, 
they might be one without words. This is showing a Christian wife how to win over their non-Christian husband. Now, the assumption is, is because they have converted to Christianity, the husband has yet to convert to Christianity. And what do, would a, a good wife want to do? She would want to see her husband come to Jesus, to have ex, uh, eternal life the way that she has eternal life. But there's a problem. In that Roman context, she didn't have rights or authority. And so rather than trying to say, I need to have rights and authority as a co-heir with, with a with, with a, a husband for the gospel, she's going to win him by showing humility and an attitude and, and demonstrating character that will be winsome. Even if that husband does not obey the word, it says, even if some do not obey the word, that's talking about husbands who aren't obeying the word, who aren't submitting to the authority of God's word, who aren't necessarily believers, but they're not applying these principles. Even if they're not obeying the word, that doesn't exonerate the wife from obeying the word. And so here is a way that a woman who can have a positive influence on her unbelieving husband by having conduct that is going to be winsome and convincing and convicting, and that is the way that she's won. Not by preaching the gospel at him, even though he probably needs somebody to preach the gospel to him, but because of that proximity of relationship, it's often those who are closest to us who are the ones who we don't want to listen to or who don't want to listen to us. And this is sad. And this is a challenging thing. So Peter is giving practical advice to wives to let their godly character be the tool that God uses so that they can win others without words. Winning them without words, this uh, does not mean that you don't talk because a wife should talk. She should communicate with her husband. But it's saying don't nag them into the kingdom. Let your character be the way that you win them over to the truth of Christ. You see, submission for wife is, means submission to the word through her husband. And it's, uh, submission does not imply inferiority in any way, either in value or ability. So submission doesn't mean that he's better, stronger, smarter, or anything. It just means that she's willingly yielding to his voice in the household. So it's not a question of inferiority. It's not a question of ability. It's a question of humility and living that way out. And so humility is a way of winning over a non-believing husband. It, doesn't address, uh, it does address the structure and the order and the wisdom and that, that humility can do to win a person over. This is the role of submission for the wife being wise in the application of these biblical truths. And the wife is ultimately showing submission in that marriage relationship by submitting to the word of God. And so these are biblical principles. Now, submission for the husband in this situation is the husband needs to be submitting to the word because the advice to the wife is even if he isn't submitted to the word, you need to submit to the word. But so for the non-believing husband, he needs to submit to the word. He needs to put his trust in Christ. He needs to be born again. He needs to become a Christ follower. Now, if the man is already a believer, then he needs to be submitted to the word himself so that he can live out a way in a, his life in a way which will encourage good communication and uplift his spouse, his wife. So the guy doesn't get a free pass but just because specifically the woman is instructed to show submission to her husband in the context of this marriage relationship. To be honest, submission for a man in some instances means that he needs to man up and lead well. And that means listening to both the Lord and to the input of his wife. Manning up never means putting down or belittling one's own wife. That is abusive, and that's domineering, and that is not showing the principle of respect that the Bible highlights continually. So submission by the wife does not mean domineering and belittling by the husband. And so, so often we can take these terms singularly and make incorrect assumptions. So submission is a beautiful word, and we are all, men and women, called to submission ultimately to the Lord. But there's a healthy aspect of submission that takes place. And the result is that there'll be convincing conduct uh, by the, the spouse in this, uh, this relationship. Because it says they will see uh, your respectful and pure conduct. Now that word see in the, in the Greek is, it, 
is talking about watching attentively. The husband will watch attentively the conduct and the character of his wife, and the Spirit of God can use that as a tool to win him over. But not only is the husband watching, the family is watching, and society is watching. And so this aspect of pure and respectful conduct that the world is seeing can be actually winsome to others that are outside of the family of God of saying this is a reflection of godly character. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. So submission, rather than putting somebody down as a doormat, is a very powerful and winsome tool when lived out by strong, confident people who are submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we're submitted to Christ, we can appropriately yield to fellow human beings who are not superior or inferior to us by our very nature. So that respectfulness is something that is very important. It's interesting, that, but the word in the Greek is, is phobos, which is also used for, translated for fear. But it's not talking about being afraid of. It's just talking about for the respect and the authority for structure. And that pure conduct is so important. Secondly, we see not only the character of a godly woman, we also see the appearance of a godly woman in verses 3 and 4. Now, while uh, verses 1 and 2 says, referring to uh, one's own husband... This uh, verses 3 and 4 are more of a broad and general category to women because it's not specifically related to the interactions with a, a husband. Verses 3 and 4 it says, Do not let your adorning be external, from the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or clothing you wear. But let your adorning be hidden, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious." This is a, a very beautiful uh, passage because it's, it, there are several words in this passage which are unique in the entire New Testament. They are adorning, braided, put it on, and the clothing you wear. They're all used only one time, and it's in the same verse. You have four, ver four words that are used only one time. But it addresses several aspects of the appearance. It's talking about the external facades. Now, the external appearance is not a bad thing. It's just not the main thing. And so that's why Peter says, don't let your adorning be primarily external. I added primarily in because the context would imply that. Don't let it be external. Don't let that, let that be the primary focus of who you are. And then he gives some specifics. It's like the, the, the braided hair and the putting on of jewelry. And so he's addressing clothes and makeup. Uh, you know, it's inter the interesting thing about the word adorning it's used 186 times in the New Testament, uh, and the vast majority of those uh, references mean the world or the universe. It's the word cosmos, with the cosmos. And so the adorning is the cosmos, but here it's talking about uh, the, the, the um, um, accents that we're putting. And so the, the cosmos, the universe and the world, really is a reference to the stars in the sky, the beautiful adorning that God made in this created world, these external things. And so he's saying don't let your adorning be on these external things, the, 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 the braided hair or the golden jewelry, but let it be uh, the other things that are deeper, the internal qualities. It's interesting to, to note that in Isaiah uh, chapter 3, verses 18 through 24, I'm not going to look up the passage, but he lists a lot of these specific things, and he says that it's all going to fade away. I don't know if you've ever had, uh, been in close proximity with grandparents, but I grew up in a multi-generational uh, uh, family, and my grandmother lived with us, and, and, and she would, in, in addition to telling me and my brother that we were mean and ugly and rotten to the core because we were rascals, uh, she would also say, beauty is only skin deep, ugliness goes all the way to the bone. Beauty is sick and fading fast while ugly holds its own. And, and so, you know, that proverbial wisdom was drawn from these biblical principles of don't let those external adornings be the main thing because there are other things that are more important. The, and that is the internal foundations that we see. The heart and the hidden beauty are things that don't die. They don't perish. They don't fade away. So while it's okay, this isn't, now see what, with this passage, it can be taken saying, well, women shouldn't wear makeup or braid hair or put on gold and jewelry. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying don't let that be the primary way that you adorn yourself. And that, don't let that be the primary way that you show the goodness of God. 
Let it be reflected through the character issues. Let your appearance be driven by what comes from the heart and overflows. And that makes you truly a beautiful person. It says that a gentle and quiet spirit is the type of internal foundation, the adornment which can impact our external perception. So rather than going with the facades to cover up any perceived flaws in who we are, let that heart be the thing that characterizes who you are as women and as wives. Because it says that God sees these qualities and he values them. That gentle and quiet spirit, that peaceable spirit, that those factors of the internal undying quality are the things that are precious to God. And so just remember, as you are adorning yourself internally with the, that gentle and kind spirit, hey, God so sees. Saying, don't let your and even though others might not see and understand, the, God the, sees the, and he the, values the that. Hair or the so we've jewelry. seen the character but of a godly uh, wife. The, we've seen the, the appearance of a godly woman. And thirdly, we see the, the attitude of a godly wife in verses 5 and 6. And this is the heart revealed. So following the, the refined beauty, we see the heart is revealed in verses 5 and 6. It says, for, how, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Once again, their own husbands, talking about a marriage relationship. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now what we see from this section is that Sarah, like many women from old, they ha she had her hope in God. She had the same hope for salvation as godly men had. So her hope was in the Lord. You see, it's all about a focus on the Lord. And so the godly women, they had a hope in the Lord for the same salvation that the godly men had. Now, one of the things that we know about Sarah is that she was a beautiful woman. You know, she was, even in her old age, she was a very, very physically attractive woman. But what was more important than her external physical beauty that she was a humble woman, humbling herself. Now, it's interesting because that word so cosmos saying, your, has a, a, another form, the, and it's uh, the, the, cosmeto, the and that's the word from which we derive beauty. cosmetics. And so uh, she was adorning herself. herself. She was putting on the cosmetics of, of humility. That was her embellishment, and that was something that was honorable in how she lived that out. So she adorned herself by submission, which is a yielding to the appropriate relationship. And like, like I said, that's not a question of inferiority or superiority or, or, or higher skills or intelligence. It's none of those factors. It's just an operational organization that the Lord put out. And so that's the, the, the challenge. Is here I am a dude saying, hey, this is what God's word says. But the, the fact is, is it's not me saying it. It's God's word that's saying it. I just have to deal with what God's word says. The thing is, is people can't abuse things. And we have to be careful to make sure that we don't abuse God's word. We see that that submitting again is, is, is comes back up. And that's just, that word submission really comes from the, the sense of to hearken or to listen to a voice. We're going to listen to instruction. And so th t here we see the teaching is for uh, Sarah to obey her own husband. But what we need to understand is this is not obedience like a, a child obeying a parent. But rather it's more like a general who speaks to a colonel. They're co-equal as human beings, but they just have a functional rank for organization and structure within a, an, or, an organizational structure. So I think of, um, you know, dealing with attitudes of, of insubordination. If you've been in any work environment, whether it's military, job, uh, a coaching, a team, there can be uh, insubordination which takes place. And in order to avoid... We have th these structures in order to avoid chaos, and that's, that's why you have these organizational structures, because if you didn't have organizational structure, you'd have comp complete chaos. And so a leader needs, if a leader needs to pull rank on somebody, it might be because uh, they're appealing to the authority structure because they, they lack the personal character to, to win people in an influential way. Uh, but the thing is, is that you have a young lieutenant he has delegated authority, and a master sergeant has to obey the commands of the young lieutenant, even though the master sergeant has multiple years of experience, and the young lieutenant doesn't have a whole lot of practical experience. 
And so if the young lieutenant gives the master, old master sergeant a command, ultimately the master sergeant needs to obey the lieutenant because of rank and order. And if he doesn't, it's insubordination. But a wise young lieutenant will not be bossing around a master sergeant, but will, will, will be consulting that master sergeant for the wisdom, the insight, and the experience to help him do his job well. So pulling rank is a last-ditch effort in order to avoid absolute chaos. But it's not the first tool that is used. You know, often we see this whole concept of subordination or submission, and it can be a fearful thing. But it says here, when if a, a woman is like Sarah, if she is doing good and not fearing anything that is frightening. There are things that are frightening out there. They're really scary. But we need to make sure that we're not living in fear because fearfulness is contrary to God's goals for us. You know, fearfulness is not the denial that things are very scary out there. But we can't let our lives be fear-driven because fear-driven decisions often are bad decisions. Because fear-driven decisions lead to pragmatically driven decisions or even which is contrary to faith-driven decisions. So fearfulness flows from, uh, excuse me, fearlessness flows from faith. You know, Abraham did, Abraham did some crazy stupid things. You know, he went in and he said to Pharaoh, uh, Sarah, she's my sister. Stupid. He went to another king and said, she's my sister. Crazy, stupid things. Because he, he was, uh, wasn't operating according to faith. Fearlessness flows from faith. If he had been fearless, he would have been operating from faith and he could have been forthright about what he was saying. But fearfulness motivates manipulation. You know, Sarah, as well, she did some crazy, stupid things. She said, hey, I think it might be a good idea for you to take my uh, servant, Hagar, and have her for a wife and have children by her. Now, not a good idea. That created a lot of conflict. And it was because of a fear that she engaged in this, and it created tension in the household. So we can't let fearfulness op control how we operate. So what are the areas of life, wives, what are the areas of life, uh, character, adornment, and attitude that need to be adjusted to improve your relationship with your husband as a witness to an observing world. Well, as we continue to examine the, the Christian conduct in the family, the Bible also speaks a word to husbands, and that's verse 7, and that's just the last point. I'm only going to spend about five minutes here. It says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. hindered. Here, in this one verse, there's a lot of content for guys, for husbands. It says we need to ab be abiding in an understanding way with our wives. If you're not married, then you need to start developing the practice of abiding with un in understanding ways so that when you are married, you can apply these tools to your, your future spouse. Abiding in an understanding way implies being a student of your spouse. It says, live with your wives in an understanding way. The word translated understanding is gnosis or knowledge. Do a knowledgeable way. Be a student of your wife. Know who she is. How can you develop her to be all that God has created her to be? You know, if she's showing submission and respect, the purpose is not to beat her down, but to build her up. And as a, as a co-heir for salvation, let her use all of her gifts and abilities that are submitted to the word of God to, for the advancement of his kingdom and his glory. And so we need to be students of in, in loving ways with our spouses. Learn your wife, understand your wife, and develop her to be all that God wants her to be. And also to embrace the complementary differences and develop and utilize the differences and the uniqueness. She's going to have areas where she's stronger than you. And you're going to have areas where you're stronger than her. And there's a nature, generally speaking, of how we're wired. And let those complementary differences come together to make us stronger. So being a living with your wife in an understanding way means to be a student and to help develop those different gifts and those strengths where she's stronger than you for the good of your household. But also... It means demonstrating honor and respect for your wife as well. It says wives should respect their husbands. Husbands are also to show some R-E-S-P-E-C-T to their wives, as Aretha Franklin put it. 
You know, weaker, when it's talking about a weaker vessel, that doesn't mean that there's inferiority. Biologically, men are stronger in some instances because of women's emotional sensitivity, which is a very great strength. It can also, in very highly volatile situations, it can become a weakness. And so it's not a question of inferiority. No way. Weaker doesn't mean inferior. It just means that it's different in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that we will look at in just a second. It's celebrating that complementary difference. It's, it's recognizing the importance of humility in, the, in embracing our biblically imposed limitations. You know, that's, it's challenging for a, a, a woman because I say women are more like Christ than men are because a woman is co-equal with a man in creation, in value, in intellect, in every capacity, well, except possibly physically, just from a biological standpoint, but all of the, the, the moral intellectual areas completely uh, equal, but yet there's a, a, a certain role limitations that Scripture puts out there. But, and you might be saying, well, that's not fair. Well, is it fair that I can't be a priest because I'm not Jewish? Or that all Jews couldn't be priests because they weren't Levites? Or all Levites couldn't be priests because they weren't from the tribe of Aaron. It was just it was a, a, a standard that God put forward in order to accomplish his purposes. And so we can't second guess those types of, of principles. But what we see here is, is there, we need to honor each person wherever they are, wherever they have been called, and whatever gifts and abilities that they have. It's not one of uh, ability. It's one of humility. It's not a question of inferiority. It's a question of submission to God's word you know something even the king had limits the kings were not allowed to offer sacrifices and guess what happened when king saul tried to offer a sacrifice that he was not allowed to do because it wasn't his role god says i reject you he rejected him because he was being presumptuous and living into a role that was not his role he was a king he was not a priest and he had no right to exercise in a priestly function it was a purpose of order and we see that the marriage relationship is to reflect the glory of God. And, and so when we see the husband and wife together in marriage, it's a complementary union to reflect God's glory. And so in the same way that the son is equal to the father, but su- for a temporary time subjugated himself and became a sum- humble servant on the cross, in eternity men and women are, are experiencing the full level of, of equality even though for a temporary time on earth the Bible puts down a procedure of submission. I know that's not a popular position to say, and it has been abused, and the abuses are wrong, and we need to call out the abuses. But guys, we need to stand up and be the leaders that are empowering, encouraging, respecting, and not beating down women and our wives. And so we see this this principle here. When it's talking about the weaker vessel, it's not talking about inferiority. But I'm going to use an illustration to to help bring this clarity so it doesn't get abused anymore. It's like fine china and crystal stemware is the woman, as the weaker vessel versus the stoneware and the ceramic mugs like the guys. You got it? What's going to cost more? Fine china and leaded crystal or stoneware and ceramic mugs? Dudes, we can take a lot of abuse, but we don't cost as much. And so when we talk about the weaker vessel, think in terms of the comparison of the fine china versus the ceramic mugs. And I'm a ceramic mug, and I'm okay with my role as a ceramic mug. I'm great for heating up hot chocolate, and you can put me in a microwave. But uh, I'm not very valuable compared to my my lovely, lovely uh, leaded crystal wife. And so all of these things, we see these differences. So rather than demeaning one another because of the difference, let's celebrate the differences. Exalt and lift up one another. Show the proper respect. And then operate as co-heirs. It says we are are co-heirs. And so husbands, it says, live with your wives in understanding ways, showing her honor as the the woman, as the weaker vessel, the fine china, since they are co-heirs with you in the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered co-heirs same inheritance same reception in the heavenlies same inheritance no difference so get it right here on earth and don't misuse the responsibility of leadership that you have and you need to be developing your wives in ways that honor them this is grace 
And if you don't do that, it's going to impact your prayer. You think that you can be spiritual and not live in an understanding way with your wife? You got it wrong. It will hinder your prayers. So guys, while you, well, you only got one verse, it is a power-packed verse. Get it together and, and develop your wives and treat the women in our lives with respect and honor and develop and never use that as an opportunity to try to demand submission. That's the command to the wives. That's not the command for the guys to enforce. Their job is to honor, respect, and to, to, to live in an understanding way. So guys, what ways can you improve in the area of honor and understanding your wife? Because the main idea is who you are in Christ guides how you interact with your spouse. So make sure that you're living in an understanding way so that you can honor Jesus. What's your next step? You know, live out the word of God in an in appropriate way. If you've not, and the thing is, is all of this relationship of the, the husband and wife is to model Christ in the church. Christ gave himself up for his bride, the church. The relationship of a husband and wife should be modeling that giving self up for the cause of the gospel. So if you never don't know Jesus, I would invite you to come to Jesus as Savior and Lord and experience harmony and relationship the way God intended it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.